From a collection of unmitigated pedantry, the blog of history professor Brett Devereaux. The Status Quo Coalition. This week, we're going to take a look at an aspect of contemporary international relations, rather than ancient ones. As has become somewhat customary, I am going to use the week of July 4th to talk about the United States. Or more correctly, for this July 4th, the informal coalition with formal components of countries the United States inhabits and leads. In some ways, this is following up on a thread left hanging a couple of years ago when I commented briefly that I didn't think the term empire effectively described the U.S. position in the international order. And so this post will focus on what I do think is the U.S. position in the international order, although the focus here is going to be somewhat less on the United States' role within what I am going to call the status quo coalition than it is on the coalition itself. Because the existence and breadth of this coalition is really unusual and thus remarkable. Indeed, it may be indicative of broader shifts in how interstate relationships work in an industrial-slash-post-industrial world, where institutions and cultural attitudes are beginning, slowly, to catch up to the new realities our technology has created. Meanwhile, if you want to be part of the ACOOP Coalition, you can support this project on Patreon. We do, however, insist on a notional 2% of GDP support target that everyone seems to ignore because, like NATO, there is no enforcement mechanism. If you want updates whenever a new post appears, you can click below for email updates, or follow me on Twitter, at Brett Devereaux, for updates as to new posts, as well as my occasional ancient history, foreign policy, or military history musings, assuming there is still a Twitter by the time this post goes live. I am also on Mastodon, at Brett Devereaux, at historians.social, and Blue Sky, at brettdevereaux.bsky.social. Though... I am most active on Twitter still, for now. Balancing But first, before we get into the coalition itself, I think it is a good idea to jump back to some of our international relations theory, particularly some neorealism, to think about how countries ought, in theory, to be behaving, based on how they have, in the past, normally behaved under conditions like those today. Mostly, of course, this is to point out that a rather chunky group of countries are not behaving this way, which is the striking fact this essay is attempting to explain. We've talked about the most common conditions states find themselves in, interstate anarchy, before. In brief, interstate anarchy is a condition in which there are many states operating in a state system which has few or no constraints on the use of violence. Because larger states can use the greater resources of their large size to impose their interests on smaller states, these conditions create a dog-eat-dog -dog race in militarism, where the only way for states to avoid becoming prey is to become the most effective predators. Such systems can be durable, if not stable, because everyone is doing this creating a Red Queen effect, where, because all of the states are trying desperately to maximize security by maximizing military power, no one actually gets ahead. But sometimes one or more powers do get ahead and begin to dominate the system. If it is several larger powers doing this, what we tend to see emerge are balance of power systems. These two can be durable, and even potentially stable, for a time, because of a key behavior that emerges among both the larger great powers and smaller states. Balancing. This behavior will be immediately familiar to players of strategy games, but we see it emerge in actual state systems too. The logic is fairly simple. Weaker powers benefit from the relative independence that continued competition in the system gives them. Consequently, small powers want to avoid any one winning the game, since a singular winning power would be able to dominate 
and possibly absorb them. The result of this behavior is the emergence of a balance of power, facilitated by the fact that the powers in the system tend to align against whichever powers appear strongest, in order to check their advance. European politics from 1500 to 1945 followed this pattern, with shifting coalitions forming to contain any power or alliance that seemed on course to achieve a breakout from the competitive system. Thus, the anti-Habsburg coalitions of the 1500s and early 1600s, or the anti-French coalitions of the early 1700s, followed by balancing against Britain in the late 1700s, and then balancing against France again in the aftermath of the French Revolution, before the unification of Germany led to balancing against that power. The same behavior is visible in antiquity in both the Greek conflicts of 431 to 338, balancing first against Athens, then Sparta, then Thebes, and finally a failed effort to balance against Macedon, and the behavior of the Hellenistic successor states, and the Greek polis, after Alexander's death in 323, until Rome achieves breakout in the 2nd century. Balancing doesn't always work, of course. Sometimes, a large imperial power is able, by luck or superior resources, to achieve victory anyway usually by winning a war of containment, a war where a large balancing coalition attempts to cut a rising power back down to size. Rome successfully overcomes two, arguably three, of these on its way to achieving what we might term hegemonic breakout. First, in the Third Samnite War, 298 to 290, the Romans face down a grand coalition of Samnites, Etruscans, and Gauls. Essentially, every non-Greek power not already part of Rome's growing Italian empire. Note 1. It is striking, but oh so typical, of failed containment that one group holds aloof for what seem like cultural reasons. Rome only just wins the Third Samnite War. Had the Italian Greeks joined in, the Romans probably would have lost. Instead, the Greeks of southern Italy opt to wage their own war, the Pyrrhic one, lose that one too, and thus their independence. The refusal of key Greek states to join the balancing coalition against Philip II of Macedon is a similar sort of lesson. Sitting out the big containment war can have catastrophic consequences for the folks sitting it out on the benches. End of note one. The Greek powers then try their luck, inviting Pyrrhus in a similar balancing coalition, but also lose. The consequence of those wars was undisputed Roman hegemony in Italy. Balancing had been tried and failed. When balancing fails, the resulting system is hegemony. Once balancing fails, everyone's interests suddenly recalculate in a diametrically opposed way. So long as balancing was possible, it was in states' interest to oppose the leading power in an effort to contain it. The moment balancing becomes impossible, it is suddenly in every state's interest to support the leading power and align with it in the hopes of persisting as a client state and maintaining at least some degree of autonomy. Of course, the converse of this is that if the hegemon should stumble in some way, everyone's interests all shift back to balance of power just as quickly. This is why some empires, especially very decentralized ones with lots of vassal states, can decline for ages before failing very rapidly all at once. The collapse of the Neo-Assyrian Empire in the last three decades of the 7th century BC is a good example of this. Once it becomes clear that central imperial power is weak, both subject peoples, Egypt, Babylon, and tributary neighbors, Medea, Persia, all turn on the form of hegemon more or less all at once, leading to rapid disintegration. These patterns of state behavior are quite well established, and one could pile example after example of these general trends. They are of course not laws. States act in ways that deviate from their neorealist interests all the time. The people leading them make blunders and miscalculations, stand on principle, or make decisions for ideological reasons often enough. 
but in general, when describing the pattern of decisions of a large number of states over a reasonably long period of time, say three decades or so, the pattern holds pretty well, except right now. The Failure of Balancing Immediately after the end of the Cold War, we got the rough result we might expect. The rapid expansion of U.S. influence as the United States, the sole remaining superpower after the collapse of the USSR, became a global hegemon and was thus in a position to rewrite the rules of international relations to suit itself. The end of history and all that. Many countries more consciously aligned with the United States, and a few more were made into high-profile examples of what might happen to countries that failed to align with the new hegemon, being either regime-changed or isolated from the global economy. That part wasn't the surprise. What was surprising is that in the years that followed, a number of potential counterweights to the United States did in fact emerge during what we may term the end of the end of history. And yet, balancing didn't meaningfully reassert itself. On the one hand, two major revisionist powers emerged, Russia and China, with one of them clearly having the economic heft as a peer rival to the United States, to shield potential allies from the full brunt of American economic might and the nuclear umbrella to prohibit direct U.S. military intervention in areas of high concern. Meanwhile, a third possible power, the EU, emerged as the dog that didn't bark, a confederation of European states with enough economic power and population to immediately form a peer competitor, or at least containing coalition against U.S. influence, which simply opted not to. Under the balancing model, we ought to expect a fairly wide range of countries to begin aligning with the potential competitors to the United States in order to limit American influence and constrain what the United States can do. A more multipolar world, they might well think, should offer great latitude for those countries to pursue their own interests. Instead, global opinion looks like this. Image, polling charts of different countries' attitudes towards the United States. Image description, charts from this Pew Research Center report. End of image description. That data from a June 2023 study of global perceptions of the United States is pretty remarkable. Of course, polling like this varies by the political moment and the administration in power in the United States. And so, the figures might not have been quite so favorable to the United States back in, say, 2018. Indeed, they were less favorable, but still net favorable, back in 2018 during the Trump presidency, which, regardless of your politics in the USA, was, as a matter of data, less well-regarded abroad, and before the war in Ukraine. But as interesting as the fact that the United States is viewed favorably in these countries, which, to be fair, is not all countries, but is a solid cross-cut of countries that are now, or are likely to become, major global power centers, sans Russia and China, in which it is impossible to do such polling, is the odd cross-implications of the results. To oversimplify the results a touch, we might say that the average respondent thinks that the United States is a meddlesome busybody that only occasionally considers the needs of other countries, and that the United States is thus a force for good and peace, and they like it very much, thank you. That is to say, respondents overwhelmingly thought the USA, quote, intervenes in the affairs of other countries, end quote and responses were profoundly ambivalent as to if the United States even tries to consider the interest of other countries. But despite that, almost two-thirds of the respondents concluded that the USA contributes to peace and stability, and consequently had a positive view of it. 
And that's not just some polling data. Globally, we can see the failure of balancing. Despite the fact that the first real challenger to the US-led world order since 1989 has emerged in the form of the People's Republic of China, the PRC has the same meager list of allies in 2023 that it had in 1953, North Korea. Russia, likewise, has a single European client state, Belarus. Russian friendship with Hungary has merely bought neutrality, not aid. The idea that BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, would constitute some developing world coalition hasn't really materialized either. While the rest of the BRICS won't, for economic reasons, join the anti-Russian sanction regime, they also aren't sanction-busting to any significant degree. Even China's support for Russia has been remarkably tepid. These are precisely the countries that ought to be eager to balance against the United States in order to open space to push their own interests. Meanwhile, the United States' list of allies is preposterous. Of the top 10 countries by nominal GDP, a decent enough measure of potential military capabilities, one is the United States, and six more, note two, three, Japan, four, Germany, six, UK, seven, France, eight, Italy, and nine, Canada. End of note two are close allies of the United States. Of the next ten, five more, note three. South Korea, Australia, Spain, the Netherlands, and Turkey. End of note three. Are formal U.S. treaty allies. One is pointedly neutral, note four, Switzerland. End of note four. And three more, note five, Mexico, Saudi Arabia, and Indonesia. End of note five. Have either extensive economic ties with the United States, significant military ties with the United States, or both. Meanwhile, the list of formal treaty allies of the United States is expanding, with the addition of Sweden and Finland to NATO. Note 6. Tevetula, and hopefully soon, Valkomen. Assuming Google Translate has not let me down. End of Note 6. Likewise, the formal American infrastructure in the Indo-Pacific seems to be deepening rather than declining with a range of countries expressing at least some interest in joining AUKUS, or at least an AUKUS-like deal with the United States in the region. France, which was more than a little wounded by the AUKUS Pact, which unilaterally cancelled a deal they had with Australia with basically no notice, nevertheless remained in NATO and remains a major component of the NATO-led support of Ukraine. This was, I should note, no sure thing France pulled out of NATO's main command structure while remaining in the alliance and only rejoined in 2009. Again, in a period where we might expect balancing against the United States, France has pulled closer, not further away from Uncle Sam. At the same time, it is not the case that all countries, or even most countries, are aligning with the United States. One of the very striking indicators of this is the lack of appetite in much of the world for sanctions against Russia. Most countries are both unwilling to sanction Russia and unwilling to sanction bust in favor of Russia. A huge portion of the world, including nearly all of the global south, a term I dislike, but it will do here, are functionally non-aligned. But that very non-alignment is useful for the United States. If there is a large pro-USA coalition, a large non-aligned non-coalition, and then isolated revisionist powers, that is a system where the American geopolitical vision remains the predominant one. Image. Map of countries on Russia's unfriendly countries list. Image description. Via Wikipedia. A map of countries on Russia's unfriendly countries list which is a good barometer of countries actively imposing sanctions against Russia. That said, because of the way sanctions work, countries that don't 
impose such sanctions may still have to abide by them in order to retain access to capital markets. So, even countries like India and China, which haven't joined the sanction regime, are still impacted by it. End of image description. And I don't think the non-aligned states are sleepwalking here. I think they know this, and in many cases, broadly prefer this outcome. You can see that preference reflected in the views of countries like Indonesia, India, Kenya, and Nigeria in the chart above. They won't back the United States if that incurs meaningful costs. These are developing countries that cannot afford grandiosity after all. But they also won't oppose the United States without a pretty substantial incentive. China's efforts to buy allies through the Belt and Road Initiative appear to have spent a lot of money buying roughly zero allies globally. A whole lot of these countries, as you can see in the Pew polling data of some of the largest above, seem pretty content to let Uncle Sam and pals run the show, while they focus on economic and political development at home. Balancing appears to have failed without really even being tried. A handful of countries have tried to exploit what I think we can identify as balancing strategies. Israel retains studiously open channels with all of the major powers, while both Turkey and Indonesia have at least sounded out the idea of replacing US or NATO equipment in their militaries with Russian equipment. But where we might expect to see the emergence of a real anti-US hegemony coalition, there is remarkably little appetite at present. Hungary is more pro-Russia than the rest of Europe, but not pro-Russia enough to send Russia tanks, the way the rest of Europe sends Ukraine tanks. Viktor Oberon is at most only performatively pro-Russian, whereas the rest of NATO is actively pro-Ukrainian in a way that bolsters American security policy. Instead, the revisionist states, both large, Russia, China, and small, Iran, North Korea, largely stand both apart from each other and lack any kind of broader coalition that might reach other wealthy, industrialized countries with the will to actually make a challenge to the U.S.-produced international system feasible. For a revisionist power, this is a real challenge. Being isolated is no fun, and successful efforts to overturn a leading power generally require either lots of alliances, diplomatically isolating the leading power, or both. So long as the United States sits ensconced in an alliance system with dozens of the richest countries on Earth, the U.S.-led international system is very difficult to revise. Just ask Russia how hard it is to move some borders in Europe. And yet again, this is strange. Because the countries arrayed en masse around the United States ought to be some of the very countries, strong regional powers with big economies, that might benefit most from having the freedom to revise the international order to suit themselves. And yet, they don't. Why? Ode to the status quo. I think the answer here is actually simple. The incentives for these countries have changed. And now, enough time has passed that they've realized it. The difference between Russia and France is, to be blunt, that the French know something the Russians haven't learned yet but are apparently in the process of learning right now. But let's back up for a moment. One of the very basic facts about IR theory is that, by necessity, it is developed using exemplars from the past. In particular, that means using mostly the pre-industrial or early industrial past, if only because all examples we draw on must come before the present. And we've only had lots of industrial societies interacting with each other for about a century and a half. We have centuries of balance of power politics in agrarian Europe, but far fewer years spent watching how post-industrial societies behave. And indeed, 
Because social development is a process, we may not even yet be able to observe how mature post-industrial societies behave, because our institutions and mores may only slowly be developing into a stable shape. It took millennia from the development of farming to the emergence of the kind of large, extraction-based polities which became the standard large-scale organization of farmers. It is not at all clear that the societies we have now are stable, mature, post-industrial societies, so much as some larval stage of transition to more stable forms. But in any event, much of this theory was based on agrarian societies or early industrial states. And one of the features of agrarian interstate relations was that returns to war outpaced returns to capital, which is a fancy way of saying you could get richer faster by conquest than by development. Under those sorts of conditions, most powers were going to be, in some form, revisionist powers, because most powers would have something to gain by attacking a weaker neighbor and seizing their resources, mostly arable land and peasant farmers to be taxed. Indeed, that basic interaction creates much of the churn of interstate anarchy. Everyone has an incentive to prey on their neighbors, creating the dog-eat-dog -dog brutality of interstate interactions. The only countries without such an interest would be countries that were very small and weak, seeking to avoid being absorbed themselves. But as we've discussed, industrialization changes all of this. The net returns to war are decreased because industrial war is so destructive and lethal, while the returns to capital investment get much higher due to rising productivity. In the pre-industrial past, fighting a war to get productive land was many times more effective than investing in irrigation and capital improvements to your own land, assuming you won the war. But in the industrial world, fighting a war to get a factory is many, many less times more effective than just building a new factory at home, especially since the war is very likely to destroy the factory in the first place. This was not always the case. The great wealth of many countries, and indeed industrialization itself, was built on resources acquired through imperial expansion. Now, the cost of that acquisition is higher than simply buying the stuff. War is no longer a means to profit, but an emergency response to avoid otherwise certain extreme losses. So whereas in the old system, almost every power, except potentially the hegemon, had something to potentially gain by upending the stability of the system, the economics of modern production means that quite a lot of countries will have absolutely nothing to gain from a war, even a successful one. Now, that dispassionate calculation has arguably been true for more than a century. The First World War was a massive exercise in proving that nothing could be gained from a major power war that would be worth the misery, slaughter, and destruction of a major power war. Subsequent conflicts have reinforced this lesson again and again, yet conflicts continue to occur. Azargat argues in part that this is because humans are both evolved in our biology and thus patterns of thinking and emotion, as well as our social institutions for warfare and aggression. We have to unlearn those instincts and redesign those institutions, and this process is slow and uneven. But we have started to learn, and that has begun to influence state calculations. But note that those calculations are going to be fairly directly related to the level of economic development in a state. The more economic development, the more strongly the interest calculation tilts against war and towards stability. At the same time, 
states aren't unitary actors. Every state has conflict within it, conflicting visions of how the state ought to be run, and so on. Those conflicts can, of course, become violent and boil over into broader conflicts which might end up involving even states who might not wish to be at war. Alternately, catastrophic state failure can produce refugee flows and other humanitarian disasters, which can be destabilizing and trigger conflicts or convince states who do not want a war that nevertheless war is the least bad option. That said, not all countries seem, in the post-World War II world, admittedly not the largest sample, to equally produce these sorts of externalities. In particular, rich democracies with robust protections for human rights and civil liberties tend not to. That isn't to say such countries don't have internal problems, but that these problems tend to be contained. They don't generate refugee flows or cross-border insurgencies. Part of this is presumably that these tend to be strong states which can mostly maintain order in the borders, and partly it is that the democratic nature of these states channels most internal divisions into peaceful democratic processes, while the protections for a range of human rights and civil liberties reduce the costs of losing any particular round of democratic decision-making, incentivizing peaceful repeat players in the game. Please note how limited this argument is. It does not require that liberal democracies, note 7, American readers, liberal here means with liberty, not of the political left. So a democracy with protections for core liberties and human rights is a liberal democracy. End of note 7. Function perfectly. It does not require that they resolve all of their internal problems equitably or reach the right policy solutions or even that their internal political systems are entirely peaceful. It merely requires the greatest extremes of internal conflicts to be funneled into the political process. Given how rare it is for consolidated democracies to deconsolidate to the point that Arguing that it has never actually happened remains a live argument in political science. Much depends on how one defines consolidated. It seems fairly clear that liberal democratic systems largely work in limiting violence in the political process and preventing it from either overturning the state or spilling over into neighboring states. But all of that alters the incentives. For the inhabitants of those states, the status quo is actually really good. These are, after all, countries that are both rich and free, a distinction that we're going to keep coming back to in this discussion. Such countries cannot get any richer through war or any more free. Violent revisions to the status quo are thus only going to be bad for them. Moreover, they share all sorts of other interests because being rich and free creates a lot of coincidences of interests. Rich countries generally prefer the free flow of goods because their highly productive economies benefit from trade. They generally prefer the free flow of ideas because both their political and economic systems benefit. They tend to prefer stability in other regions because they are prime targets for destabilizing refugee flows. Consequently, they tend to prefer the emergence of other rich and free countries because those tend to be good trade partners who don't generate massive refugee flows. That said, we don't have a good grasp on how to create new rich and free countries, and attempts to do so often fail. Note 8 most notably recently in Iraq and Afghanistan. But compare the successful creation of rich and free regimes, albeit it took some time, in East Asia, Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, and Eastern Europe. It doesn't always fail. End of note 8. And the good news for these rich and free countries is that the current international system 
was largely the creation of one really big, rich and free country, the United States working together with a bunch of other rich and free countries, setting the rules the way rich and free countries like them. So, the international system, embedded in organizations like the IMF, WTO, the World Bank, and to a degree, the United Nations, is institutionally structured to prefer the free movement of goods, ideas, and capital, and to discourage the revision of the status quo by force. Rather than being simply an expression of American power, though they are that, those institutions are also an expression of the collective interests of this informal collection of rich and free countries, what we might call the status quo coalition. The status quo coalition. I think this idea of a status quo coalition, which is both a key part of the structure of the United States' geopolitical position, but not exactly coextensive with it, is important to understand. In the past, I've struggled with how to describe the United States' rather odd and, indeed, large to an unprecedented degree, global system of alliances and friendships. But I think the status quo coalition serves as the bedrock foundation on which that system is built. Not every United States partner or ally is a member of the status quo coalition, but I'd argue that nearly every rich and free country is a member, and that nearly every member of the coalition is in turn a U.S. partner or ally. Indeed, the number of rich and free countries is small enough that we can simply list them, taking every country with the GDP per capita above $40,000, PPP adjusted, and a Freedom House Global Freedom Score above 70, free. I've also listed memberships, mostly for the security arrangements these countries tend to have with each other. Note that bilat indicates a bilateral security treaty with a member, usually, but not always, the UFA. F-V-E-Y stands for Five Eyes and AUKUS for, well, AUKUS. Country, Ireland, GDP per capita, 145,196. Freedom House score, 97. Memberships, EU non-aligned. Coalition member, yes. Country, Luxembourg, GDP per capita, 142,490. Freedom House score, 97. Memberships, EU, NATO. Coalition member, yes. Country, Switzerland, GDP per capita, 87,963, Freedom House score, 96, Memberships, Swiss neutrality, Coalition member, no. Country, Norway, GDP per capita, 82,655, Freedom House score, 100, Memberships, NATO, EEA, Coalition member, yes. Country, United States, GDP per capita, 80,035, Freedom House score, 83. Memberships, NATO, FVEY, AUKUS. Coalition member, team captain. Country, San Marino, GDP per capita, 78,926. Freedom House score, 97. Memberships, BILAT, Italy. Coalition member, Micronation. Country, Denmark, GDP per capita, 73,386. Freedom House score, 97. Memberships, EU, NATO. Coalition member, yes. Country, Taiwan, GDP per capita, 73,344. Freedom House score, 94. Memberships, BILAT, USA. Coalition member, yes. Country, Netherlands, GDP per capita, 72,973. Freedom House score, 97. Memberships, EU, NATO. Coalition member, yes. Country, Iceland. GDP per capita, 69,779. Freedom House score, 94. Memberships, NATO, EEA. Coalition member, yes. Country, Austria. GDP per capita, 69,502. Freedom House score, 93. Memberships, EU. Coalition member, official neutrality, yes. Country, Andorra. GDP per capita, 68,998. Freedom House score, 93. Memberships, BILAT, France, Spain, 
Coalition member, Micronation. Country, Germany. GDP per capita, 66,132. Freedom House score, 94. Memberships, EU, NATO. Coalition member, yes. Country, Sweden. GDP per capita, 65,842. Freedom House score, 100. Memberships, EU, NATO. Coalition member, yes. Country, Belgium. GDP per capita, 65,501. Freedom House score, 96. Memberships, EU, NATO. Coalition member, yes. Country, Australia. GDP per capita, 65,366. Freedom House score, 95. Memberships, FVEY, AUKUS. Coalition member, yes. Country, Malta. GDP per capita, 61,939. Freedom House score, 89. Memberships, EU. Coalition member, yes. Country, Finland. GDP per capita, 60,897. Freedom House score, 100. Memberships, EU, NATO. Coalition member, yes. Country, Guyana. GDP per capita, 60,648. Freedom House score, 73. Memberships, non-aligned. Coalition member, no. Country, Canada. GDP per capita, 60,177. Freedom House score, 98. Memberships, NATO, FVEY. Coalition member, yes. Country, France. GDP per capita, 58,828. Freedom House score, 89. Memberships, EU, NATO. Coalition member, we. Country, South Korea. GDP per capita, 56,706. Freedom House score, 83. Memberships, BILAT, USA. Coalition member, yes. Country, UK. GDP per capita, 56,471. Freedom House score, 93. Memberships, NATO, FVEY, AUKUS. Coalition member, yes. Country, Israel. GDP per capita, 54,997. Freedom House score, 77. Memberships, complicated. Coalition member, complicated. Country, Cyprus. GDP per capita, 54,997. Freedom House score, 92. Membership, EU. Coalition member, yes, non-aligned. Country, Italy. GDP per capita, 54,216. Freedom House score, 90. Memberships, EU, NATO. Coalition member, yes. Country, New Zealand. GDP per capita, 54,046. Freedom House score, 99. Memberships, FVEY, BILAT, USA, UK, Australia. Coalition member, yes. Country, Slovenia. GDP per capita, 52,641. Freedom House score, 95. Memberships, EU, NATO. Coalition member, yes. Country, Japan. GDP per capita, 51,809. Freedom House score, 96. Memberships, BILAT, USA. Coalition member, yes. Country, Czechia. GDP per capita, 50,961. Freedom House score, 92. Memberships, EU, NATO. Coalition member, yes. Country, Spain. GDP per capita, 49,448. Freedom House score, 90. Memberships, EU, NATO. Coalition member, yes. Country, Lithuania. GDP per capita, 49,266. Freedom House score, 89. Memberships, EU, NATO. Coalition member, yes. Country, Estonia. GDP per capita, 46,385. Freedom House score, 94. Memberships, EU, NATO. Coalition member, yes. Country, Poland. GDP per capita, 45,343. Freedom House score, 81. Memberships, EU, NATO. Coalition member, yes. Country, Portugal. GDP per capita, 44,707. Freedom House score, 96. Memberships, EU, NATO. Coalition member, yes. Country, Bahamas. GDP per capita, 43,913. Freedom House score, 91. Memberships, BILAT, USA, UK. Coalition member, question mark. Country, Croatia. GDP per capita, 42,531. Freedom House score, 
84. Memberships, EU, NATO. Coalition member, yes. Country, Romania. GDP per capita, 41,634. Freedom House score, 83. Memberships, EU, NATO. Coalition member, yes. Country, Slovakia. GDP per capita, 41,515. Freedom House score, 90. Memberships, EU, NATO. Coalition member, yes. Country, Latvia. GDP per capita, 40,177. Freedom House score, 88. Memberships, EU, NATO. Coalition member, yes. Country, Panama. GDP per capita, 40,177. Freedom House score, 83. Memberships, no, but close USA ties. Coalition member, no. Naturally, there are some quirks to a list like this. Some members, or arguably aspiring members, of the rich and free status quo coalition fall below my rather arbitrary GDP per capita cutoff. Greece, $39,487, 86 GFS, and Bulgaria, $27,890, 79 GFS, most notably. Both countries are both NATO states and in the EU, so they're heavily involved in the status quo coalition institutions. But these are, in a sense, free but not rich countries. But they tend to move with rather than against the status quo coalition. So I think they mostly count as members. Note 9. Note, for instance, both are active supporters of Ukraine against Russia. End of note 9. On the other hand are the rich but not free countries. Hungary, $43,907, 66 GFS, and Turkey, $41,412, 32 GFS, which are also involved in status quo coalition institutions, both NATO, Hungary, the EU. And it is, of course, immediately striking that these are the two obvious discontents with the status quo coalition's attitudes towards both the Russia-Ukraine and Syria crises. Not being free, it turns out, makes their fit with the coalition more awkward than it is for the countries that are free but not yet rich. Yet, both are, at least somewhat, connected to the coalition despite that, often moving with it, complaints, and all. The other odd exception are countries in the Americas not named the United States and Canada. Guyana, the Bahamas, and Panama all seem like they are both rich enough and free enough to be in the coalition, and yet aren't part of the formal institutions of it. This, it seems to me, is pretty clearly a product of proximity to the United States, both in that these countries already effectively have U.S. security guarantees via the Monroe Doctrine, and so don't need to be in something like NATO. That the United States would end up intervening in a major war in the Americas is almost a foregone conclusion, treaty or no treaty. And at the same time, have felt themselves on the business end of American foreign policy in the region, which has often been profoundly unpleasant. Consequently, their relations with the United States are a much larger focus, and the proximity of the United States constrains their options. We should, quite frankly, strive to do better by our neighbors than we have. Nevertheless, while the core of the coalition is the United States and its European partners, tied together by NATO, that is not the whole of the coalition, and most rich and free countries are part of it, regardless of where in the world they happen to be, with countries outside the North Atlantic often instead tied to the United States or other members in other ways. Now, one may well argue the coalition is just a figment of my imagination, but I'd argue that the renewed Russian invasion of Ukraine had demonstrated anything but. While many countries were willing to vote against Russia at the UN, the number of countries willing to sustain real economic costs by either supporting sanctions or sending meaningful aid to Ukraine was far more narrow and maps fairly well on the coalition as formulated above. The coalition action here is striking because none of the countries currently aiding Ukraine 
or sanctioning Russia had any sort of treaty obligation to do so. Instead, the coalition leapt to Ukraine's aid, with everything short of war, including free weapons, training, economic assistance, and intelligence sharing, to defend the status quo, in which they are so invested. This is why, I'd argue, the response to the war in Ukraine, and previously to cross-border conquests by ISIS, was so much more intense than status quo coalition responses to other humanitarian crises, because it threatened a core component of the status quo that territorial acquisition by conquest is not permitted in the international system. Image. Map of countries delivering military aid to Ukraine. Image description. Via Wikipedia, a map of countries that had sent aid to Ukraine. It does a good job of showing how fuzzy the boundaries of the coalition can be, but also how countries very much not in the coalition, for example, Jordan, Sudan, Pakistan, may still align with it for other security reasons. End of image description. What I want to stress here is an understanding of the coalition that it is not countries in the thrall of the United States. Rather, it is that this is a collection of countries which have developed, both economically and politically, in similar ways. Because of that similar development, they have come to have similar interests and values. And because they have already shaped the international system to favor those interests and values, they tend to act in concert in support of that international system, those interests and those values. I think this coalition in some form would continue to exist even without the United States, and it would be a major force in international politics. But of course, the United States does exist, which brings us to the United States and the Status Quo Coalition. The United States position as team captain of the Status Quo Coalition is almost Overdetermined. It is the second largest bloc member by territory, has more than twice the population of any other member, the largest economy, six times larger than the next bloc member, one of the highest GDP per capita, the most powerful military, and is also ideologically one of the founders of the bloc, being both one of the origin points for modern liberal democracy and largely responsible for creating the bloc during the Cold War. So, while I think the coalition may well have emerged without the United States, it is no surprise that, the United States being a thing that exists, the coalition is often regarded, wrongly, by American and Russian propagandists alike as simply a tool of American imperialism, a collection of smaller states huddled around Columbia's skirts. That reading is a mistake and it leads to misjudging how the coalition will act, because the coalition isn't bound together by American power, but by common interests, and so behaves differently. For the United States leading the coalition, the mistake is to assume that the members of the coalition are bound by American power, hard or soft, rather than by their own interests. That isn't to say that U.S. soft power doesn't matter, I think it matters quite a lot, and is part of why the coincidence of values in the coalition is so strong. But when it comes to getting countries to act, interests are often much stronger. And the key interest at play here is a commitment to the status quo. What that means is that the United States leadership in the coalition, and consequently U.S. global leadership, is tied to the perception that the United States is, on net, a reliable guarantor of the status quo. What is going to shake the status quo is not outside pressure, which is, as we'll see, a weak lever, but the United States as team captain acting in ways that destabilize the status quo. This, I'd argue, is why the Iraq War seemed to shake the coalition so badly. It reflected an attempt to revise the status quo, 
by expanding the coalition by force. It's also why the Trump presidency's promises of substantial revision to the United States' place in the international system prompted concerns from the coalition as well. But leading the coalition is good for the United States. For one, the vast network of interlinked institutions the coalition runs were built with U.S. economic interests in mind, and so tend to be favorable to them. Remember during the pandemic when all of the supply chains went haywire and prices rose dramatically? That's what things would be like all the time in a less globalized world. Americans would end up quite a bit poorer. Note 10. Which is why, even when then-President Trump revised NAFTA, he came up with a replacement that was mostly just NAFTA, the USMCA. The deal was already very good for the United States. Because we wrote it. End of note 10. This is a positive sum arrangement. The United States benefits a lot from the status quo it created. But other countries also benefit which is what makes that status quo durable. But all of that free trade, free movement of ideas, free movement of capital, and so on, is facilitated by coalition institutions, like SWIFT, the IMF, and so on. Leading the coalition is also, frankly, good for American security interests. Alone, the United States is a power that a rising competitor, like the PRC, could imagine, if not defeating, at least excluding, from substantial parts of the world. But ensconced in the coalition, that becomes much harder, because challenging the United States risks trade agreements with France or military action from Japan or economic warfare from Australia or diplomatic retaliation from Brussels. And remember, for the United States, like every status quo country, our interest is not having a war in the first place a system that thus raises the cost of challenging U.S. leadership to the point that no country would attempt it, is a system that makes a major war involving the USA directly a lot less likely. Which is good, actually. Not only does the coalition reinforce the American position by providing a ready suite of allies, it makes creating a revisionist coalition really hard because most of the best allies to have are already taken. Revisionist powers find themselves arriving at the pickup basketball tournament to find that every player worth having is already on team status quo, with only North Korea and Iran sitting on the bench, waiting to get picked. And so long as the United States remains a reliable steward of the status quo, that is likely to remain the case, because the very things that make a country a good pick for your team, being a developed, highly productive country with strong institutions, make them more likely to instead join team status quo. For the voting public in the United States, all of this means it is necessary to come to understand that a lot of the good things we enjoy are as much a product of our reputation, again, see the polling above, as a reasonably reliable steward of the status quo as they are of U.S. power directly. That in turn needs to influence political calculations about the costs and benefits of different courses of action, the cost for the United States of deciding to revise the status quo, is potentially much higher than it seems because it shakes the foundations of all of these mostly invisible institutions that are, in fact, the root of a lot of the United States' global power. Because the United States isn't the king or general of the status quo coalition. It's the team captain. If it proves to be a bad team captain, the team may well choose a new captain or disband altogether, with catastrophic implications for American interests. From the outside, the mistake is to assume that applying a sufficient challenge to the United States and a sufficient degree of pressure will cause balancing to reassert itself and the coalition to fall apart. Both Russia and China have tried a strategy of trying to crowbar a wedge between the EU and the United States. 
I will not say such a thing is impossible, but it is pushing uphill. The community of interest is real and pushes back. Almost inevitably, something, usually reminders of Russia and the PRC's revanchist territorial claims or some other international crisis, reminds everyone that they do, in fact, share interests and values. Instead of coming apart with pressure, the coalition solidifies with pressure because the pressure redirects everyone's attention to those communal interests rather than our petty squabbles, of which there are many. Since the community of interest is real, that pulls the block back together for collective action. And that effect makes large-scale revisionist aims quite hard to achieve. To be clear, the most obvious sort of revisionist aims are shifts in territorial boundaries. But equally, this goes for attempts to revise the structure of the global economy. For instance, to de-dollarize it, or get many nations to move away from status quo coalition financial centers, or to get rid of the IMF and the World Bank, or substantially revise assumptions about freedom of navigation. For moves that require a critical mass of large economies in order to work, as with the decisive global shift away from the dollar and euro, the problem is that there is a large block of big, rich countries that are largely uninterested in a revision to the economic status quo, and who trade with everyone. You may want to be rid of the dollar and the euro, but it is going to be rather hard to convince the Germans. That doesn't make such revisions impossible, but it guarantees that accomplishing even minor revisionist aims is going to incur outsized costs. Of course, the most striking example of this are the massive costs that Russia has incurred trying to shift its border to the West. But the PRC's efforts to revise the status quo by shifting the governance of Hong Kong and pushing territorial claims in East Asia have also, slowly but surely, pushed the status quo coalition powers to begin pushing back. And relations between the EU and the PRC seem to get frostier every month. Moreover, the coalition doesn't seem likely to go away. Once countries become rich and free, they tend to stay that way. Without a doubt, there are politicians and parties in most status quo coalition countries that promise to pull their countries out of the coalition, usually on a nationalistic basis. In practice, it seems to be hard, though surely not impossible, for such leaders to actually win elections and yet harder still once they've won elections, to actually cleanly break with the fairly complex web of interlocking interests and institutions that tie them with the coalition. The experience of Hungary and Turkey's illiberal democracies provides something of a demonstration as neither country has yet managed to fully align away from the coalition. That doesn't mean I think countries will never leave but it does mean that I think countries will tend to join the coalition at a faster clip than they leave. Global incomes, after all, are rising, and seem set to keep rising. Remember, the interests that bind the coalition together are a product of economics as much as of politics. And, unlike the zero-sum game of empire, where each empire has strong incentives not to let new powers join the empire club, economic development is positive some. Rising incomes in the developing world are good news economically for the rich status quo powers as those developing economies ship out the raw materials rich economies require and buy the goods they make. Rising incomes in developing countries make them better trade partners as rising productivity means they both have more to export and more money to spend on imported goods. Moreover, as noted, high-income democratic countries tend to be stable and not create many problems like refugee flows, which is also good news for the rich and free club. Consequently, the status quo coalition wants to encourage other countries to be like it, rich and free, and quite a lot of countries are developing with that as a goal. So while I expect that here and there countries will, for internal political reasons, 
backslide out of the coalition, barring some major catastrophe, it seems likely that the status quo coalition will grow rather than shrink over time. The big systemic risks here would seem, of course, to be nuclear war, another pandemic, or climate change. And it is no accident that the coalition countries tend to be quite worried about these. That said, it is worth remembering that even pessimistic climate change projections now expect that the impacts of climate change will cause global incomes to rise more slowly, not fall. Note 11. Rise more slowly, to be clear, is bad. It means more people in poverty longer than they needed to be. That's bad. But it is a different kind of bad than global incomes falling. More people in poverty than yesterday. With different implications. End of note 11. As a result, I don't think the coalition is likely to go away. As a historian, I'm always really reluctant in making big predictions. And I think it is worth reiterating the caution that we do not know if this current arrangement is a mature or stable form of human organization in an industrial, post-industrial world. Most of the world isn't really even fully industrialized yet. And even the parts that are haven't been long enough to make it clear that anything is settled in the long term. And it's not clear that, as global incomes rise, those rising countries will find the status quo as amenable as the current crop of rich and free countries. Especially since it sure seems like the free part matters as much, if not more, than the rich part. At the same time, as a student of the history of war, the emergence of a durable coalition in international affairs with an interest in limiting at least some kinds of wars, because let us not pretend all of the status quo powers are pacifists, is an exciting development in the growing long peace that we may hope begins to indicate that humanity might, at long last, be outgrowing war. So, the status quo coalition isn't necessarily the beginning of the end of history. Volume 2, we mean it this time. But it is, I suspect, likely to be a durable component of the international system. And, for as long as the United States remains a reliable steward of it, the foundation of American global leadership. This has been a recording from a collection of unmitigated pedantry, the blog of history professor Brett Devereaux, recorded by myself, A Great Divorce, for accessibility and sharing purposes. If you enjoyed this content and wish to engage with it or support Brett, please check the description for links to the original post on his blog, his Twitter, and his Patreon. I highly encourage you to share, support, and engage with his works on any and all platforms if you are so inclined. If you wish to support me, please do remember to like, share, and subscribe to this or any other content here that you enjoy. Thank you so much for listening.